This is the guy. A 58 year old white man was referred to our clinic for exuberant soft tissue growth over an uncertain period of time. Two early, years earlier, he had. What's up, guys? Derek, we're policemanrelates.com. Today, we are going to be talking about minoxidil. This is probably one of the main go-to uh, hair loss hair loss prevention treatments that um, most doctors will recommend off the bat half hazardly or you'll often see you know advertisements on YouTube channels without explaining to you how it works the mechanism of action or the side effect profile before just telling you go buy this shit because it's FDA approved and there's like so many channels that just like half hazardly recommend you go you buy this thing apply it to your head and fix hair loss because it's FDA approved. And it's like, yes, minoxidil does work and it's really well tolerated. It works very well. And I even link to it in my videos, but I am, <laughs> I try to lay out the whole picture so you guys understand that nothing is side effect free. Just because it is FDA approved and it's an over the counter drug, it does not mean that it does not have side effects. In fact, I think minoxidil is one of the more side effect ridden of the hair loss prevention drugs, even among some of the research chemicals I use. Like minoxidil actually is the main, I don't even use minoxidil because I get side effects from it. And I, I can literally like nuke my DHT to zero and get no side effects. But with minoxidil, I couldn't run that. That was problematic for me. So I just wanted to kind of get into a more extreme side of the spectrum to show you like how serious minoxidil can actually be not to fear monger it but just to give a perspective on drug selection it should not just come down to the fact that it's over the counter versus prescription versus um a drug in an fda pipeline or whatever i think that i don't know i think that more careful um assessment needs to be taken in terms of a drug's potential efficacy as well as its side effect profile and just because you know a widespread number of mainstream youtube channels are recommending something it doesn't just like give a stamp of approval of safety in terms of it's like yes there's a lot of clinical data to back its safety but again it's just like really annoying to see some of these channels just completely gloss over all of the information when i've myself experienced significant side effects from it and i have friends who've experienced much worse side effects from it too and there's literature that does in the extreme end there's like some pretty fucking hectic situations that can come from minoxidil that frankly i have not seen with any other drug so it's more so interesting to see this the likelihood that this is going to happen to you is extremely low but you know all these channels again they're not going to tell you about this stuff and this is just more of an interesting tidbit of information rather than rather than a fear-mongering video so just Take it with a grain of salt, but it's like, you know, you have the people with the finasteride, you'll have them give you the complete, like, polar side of the spectrum saying, like, there'll be guys, you know, that will just haphazardly say, go get it. And then there'll be people who say, oh, you're going to get post finasteride syndrome, your dick will never work again, it'll shrink, and you're going to be, you know, depressed for life, and blah, blah, blah. Like, you know, there's, there's people on both camps that are, like, hyper against it, or hyper for it, or just, like, advertised for it half hazardly without even knowing what the fuck they're talking about and that's for finasteride but i have not yet seen somebody do the polar sides of the spectrum for minoxidil and you know i feel like you might as well because some of it's actually probably just as interesting as the post finasteride syndrome stuff and again it's not to say you shouldn't do it because the majority of people are going to lie in the middle where you have no issues whatsoever and it's going to work very well so anyways orthostatic hypotension as well as pseudo acromegaly this was this was fucking baffling for me so one of my friends he had a bad he actually had a very very good response to minoxidil in terms of actual hair growth he looked fucking it looked so good <laughs> the amount of hair he grew it was like a he was like a super saiyan when he took that shit he had like the best hair i'd seen to date like his hair was like unmanageably thick it was insane but he had significant side effects too. And one of those side effects was orthostatic hypotension. This is what his blood pressure was on a good day. This was a systolic of 98 with a diastolic of 55. And he was hospitalized at one point over this. So for like almost, he actually took, stopped the drug like over a year ago. And he had been having like ridiculous side effects. It started with 
severe edema. He also had the orthostatic hypotension to the point that he was literally like fainting when he was standing up every single time. And then he just found out the other day. So he got his test results back and he tested positive for histone antibodies. And in addition to that, he's had symptoms of lupus this entire time. Some of the stuff I found that I'm gonna be displaying in this video are kind of shocking and it's stuff I found by accident when I was trying to dig into his response to minoxidil because it just seemed baffling to me. Like even to me, because I didn't, I didn't look this deep into it and I didn't realize it went this deep. So drug-induced lupus is actually something found in the medical literature from minoxidil. It turns out the number one drug that can cause a histone positive test result is something called hydralazine, which is in the same group of vasodilators as minoxidil. So he was also having an autoimmune reaction as a byproduct of the minoxidil side effects that was actually attacking his kidneys. So he's basically had to figure out this entire time, like what the fuck's going on with his blood pressure? What the hell's going on with like standing up and fainting? This crazy edema is something you would expect from minoxidil, but to the extent that it would persist for months after discontinuation. And then having this histone positive test and having autoimmune issues flying off the charts, it was just like the most baffling thing, just from the little, like a topical thing over the counter, you know, you would think totally harmless, as per, you know, all these, you know, channels that'll just be like, sign up for insert, you know, whatever, you know, cookie cutter company that sells minoxidil finasteride prescription without telling you exactly what it does or what the side effect profile could be. Those kind of guys, it's, this is the kind of shit on the extreme end of the spectrum that may happen. So, and it's more so just interesting. Again, this is still a very well tolerated drug and works extremely well. This is not the fear monger. This is just more so something that I found fascinating that you probably fucking would too, I would assume if you're on this channel. So digging into what was going on, this is, you know, the first thing we kind of looked up is when I found um, the orthostatic hypotension. So it turns out there are a lot of uh, examples in the literature of it occurring after discontinuation. So it's not like it just went away overnight, even though the half-life is like, you know, not that long. Going back as far as, uh, you know, the 70s, the 80s, minoxidil lonitin introduced in the 1970s is used as a step three or third line agent for treatment of severe refractory hypertension. Minoxidil therapy causes Hypertrichosis in 80% of patients manifested by an excessive and abnormal pattern of hair growth. Minoxidil induces reflex tachycardia, which is another brutal side effect of it. And it's one of the ones that happened to me is where you would get just like an excessively increased heart rate accompanied by edema a lot of the time. And um, some people even get like fucking heart palpitations from it. So anyways, and that's not to say that this couldn't happen with other drugs. Um, in fact, some of the research chemicals I use have actually, you know, shown to have similar side effect profiles in some cases. I just tolerate them well, fortunately, but minoxidil is, um, I think some people just like glance over the fact that it does some of this stuff because they assume it's over the counter. So therefore like nothing could be wrong with it when it's just like, it's still a drug and it should be taken seriously is all I'm trying to say. So the addition of a, uh, let's see, minoxidil induces reflex tachycardia. And if you don't know, tachycardia is like essentially when your resting heart rate goes over 100 beats per minute, it's unhealthy as fuck. And there is a direct correlation with increased heart rate and early mortality. So I don't know why there's this idea in the, uh, I don't know if it's still, you know, reinforced by some people in the uh, medical community that if you're, if your heart rate's under 100, then you're healthy. It's like, it's like, no, having a heart rate of like 95 is not fucking healthy. So anyways, if you have a heart rate like above 100, like that's a major, major concern. It's not normal. You should have a heart resting heart rate of like below the fucking, like under 70 at minimum, in my opinion, if you want to have something reflective of like decent cardiovascular health. Um, so anyways, the addition of a beta adrenergic blocking agent and a potent diuretic usually controls the tachycardia and fluid retention. Resolution of fluid retention occurs after minoxidil is discontinued if diuretic dosage is not tapered. Dehydration and orthostatic hypotension can occur in susceptible patients. In the accompanying case presentation, a patient is described in whom long-term minoxidil therapy was discontinued due to facial bleeding associated with hypertrichosis. Beta adrenergic blocking agent and diuretic dosages were continued at previous levels and an alternative vasodilating agent was initiated at the lowest dosage. Severe orthostatic hypotension occurred during a routine hypertension clinic visit one month later. 
So there's a lot of cases that you'll find online in this where these patients are, now you have to keep in mind, some of these are with oral minoxidil, but for some people, they're such hyper responders to topical, they end up with similar outcomes. And you'll find people that are using topical minoxidil that actually have pretty significant outcomes as well. Like this, this is the what the video is actually, <laughs> is actually about that you clicked on it for is um, pseudoacromegaly induced by long-term use of minoxidil. So this was, this is like above and beyond even my friend's response was like a one in like fucking a hundred thousand chance that was insane already and then when i started digging into some of this obscure stuff to try and figure out how we could you know resolve it for him because it was persisting to the point where it was not just like okay like get it out of your system let the half-life clear let things like auto regulate go back to homeostasis make sure your electrolyte intake is on point blah 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 blah, blah. Now it wasn't fixed. Like it actually took months for him to even get back to a reasonable baseline. And now he's dealing with the autoimmune issues that have continued thereafter. And it was like, it was like a short term thing. It just like triggered this autoimmune uh, response in him that, you know, maybe it would have occurred from something else that was stressful in his life at some point. But to get fucking lupus from using like topical minoxidil, like it seems fucking insane to me. So anyways, this one, uh, pseudoacromegaly induced by long-term use of minoxidil. Acromegaly is an endocrine disorder caused by chronic excessive growth hormone secretion from the anterior pituitary gland. So if you've, you've probably seen me talk about acromegaly before with, uh, you know, why, uh, like I've compared uh, GH dosages and the parallel increase in IGF-1 levels to what patients with acromegaly walk around at to kind of give an idea of what a high GH dosage actually is. Because there's a lot of people that don't realize that just like a handful of IUs or even a few IUs of pharma grade GH is going to induce a, essentially replicate a state of acromegaly while you're using it. Not like the literal, you know, like physical manifestation of it from chronic long-term use. But if you are using it on a long-term basis, you're essentially self-inducing a state of acromegaly on yourself, even using just like, you know, four IUs of pharma grade GH. Um, but anyways, significant disfiguring changes occur as a result of bone, cartilage, and soft tissue hypertrophy including the thickening of the skin, coarsening of facial features, and cutis vertices giurata. And I'm not saying, by the way, that you're going to have all these side effects if you use minox or GH at those dosages. But when you actually compare the IGF-1 levels of active acromegaly patients and people who are using pharmacograde GH for a long period of time, like they're pretty much the same. That's, that's all I'm saying. It's just a lot of it has to do with duration of exposure too. So, so you have to keep in mind, these people are have been exposed to these like dosages their entire lives, essentially. So this guy, pseudoacromegaly, on the other hand, is the presence of similar acromegaloid features in the absence of elevated growth hormone and IGF-1 levels. So basically, it looks like acromegaly, but you don't actually have IGF-1 levels that are high enough to constitute it. You're otherwise have normal GH secretion. It just looks like acromegaly, which which is weird. So we present a patient with pseudo acromegaly that resulted from the long-term use of minoxidil at an unusually high dose. This is the first case report of pseudo acromegaly as a side effect of minoxidil use. So basically they get into how rare it is, um, what causes it, um, the disease is insidious. Most patients have symptoms for five to 10 years before the diagnosis is made. And if you just want to see, like, realistically, if you want to see what the potential ramifications of using a high dose of GH is long term, just go look at what happens to acromegaly patients. You'll get a good idea pretty quick. So anyway, it talks about how uh, um, the growth of uh, facial features, um, skin folds become accentuated, um, creases on the forehead, nose, chin, no naso <laughs> nasolabial folds, overgrowth of the dermis, stuff like that, things that occur as a result of chronically high IGF-1 levels. This guy showed up more, con let's see, blah, blah, blah. this is the first time to our knowledge that such a side effect has been reported for minoxidil. More commonly, pseudoacromegaly occurs in the context of severe insulin resistance. In these patients, a post-receptor defect impairs the insulin's ability to stimulate Glucose transport, although its mitogenic signal path, signaling pathway remains intact, the unopposed mitogenic and anabolic actions that are mediated by hyperinsulinemia would result consequently in pseudoacromegaly. Of further interest, pseudoacromegaly has been associated with an autosomal recessive syndrome of skin ulceration, arthroosteolysis, carat, carat, I don't even know how to say this one, keratitis, and oligodontia. 
Anyways, so this is the guy. A 58 year old white man was referred to our clinic for exuberant soft tissue growth over an uncertain period of time. Two early, years earlier, he had undergone surgical reduction of an excessive skin fold across his forehead that interfered with his vision. Since then, he noticed gradual soft tissue enlargement of the earlobes, no, nose, and eyelids. These recurring changes were impairing his respiration and vision. He also noted the development of skin folds and deep furrows on his scalp and face. His review of symptoms was, un, was remarkable for a weight gain of 10 to 15 pounds over a one-year period, an increase in ring size by one-half size without any change in shoe size, increased moist and oily skin and increased generalized hair growth he attributed these changes to the minoxidil he had been taking for the past 10 years for hypertension his medical history was notable for coronary artery disease and by the way this is notable because it's taking it orally for hypertension not topically for hair growth but anyways so like the chances would happen to you the chances would happen to anyone even using oral is like fucking impossible but it's just it's still the same drug so it's interesting nonetheless and um Basically, this guy showed up and has very blatant, like exaggerated symptoms to the point where it's like you can tell the drug's working exceptionally well at what it's doing, but it's also causing an exceptional reaction side effect wise. Like, obviously, when you see this guy, the first thing you're going to think is probably not what I was thinking, which is, damn, this guy has sick hair for a 58 year old. But you can see here, like how much excessive hair growth he has. Um above and beyond all the obvious facial changes. So this essentially looks like a even more dramatic version of acromegaly. Like this doesn't even look like normal acromegaly. This looks like something else entirely that is like next level shit. So his IGF-1 levels are normal and he had all this, uh, you know, soft tissue growth and blah, blah, blah. And honestly, this is more of like a really, really rare phenomenon that I don't know if it would ever be replicated in another person. And could you even, they seem to think it's the minoxidil and even I'm still skeptical reading about it, but you know, you've seen the people who use minoxidil and they worry about, you know, what the premature aging of your face, whatever it seems to do. I hypothesize perhaps it might have something to do with the prostaglandin interaction, sort of the same way that latanoprost and bimanoprost may cause um, issues with chronic long-term use. However, I, you know, I don't really know. At the end of the day, this is more of just an interesting case report and an extreme way to not only find something that is just interesting as fuck that you guys would probably want to see that I just found absolutely fascinating, but above and beyond that, it's a way to exemplify that not just because a drug is over the counter, it doesn't mean that at the extreme end of the spectrum, there could not be some like crazy side effect like minoxidil induced autoimmune disease lupus, which is what my friend has right now. So just be aware of kind of like, like even if you were to use minoxidil, that might be something you want to check beforehand. Like how it's not impossible to check what your propensity, propensity is to certain things. Go through your genetic analysis, look at autoimmune markers in your blood work. There's things you can do to see if you're going to be more prone to side effects. And it's like, yeah, for the majority of people, you know, is that really necessary? Like very likely not, but, and you know, it's just, it just goes to show that these drugs should not be taken lightly, despite the fact that they're over the counter. I'm, I'm becoming redundant at this point. So I apologize for that. But you know, the minoxidil thing is like one of the drugs that works. One of the, it's one of the most effective, it's probably the most effective growth stimulant we have. And 99% of people are going to be just fine using it. Like, but I don't use it and it doesn't mean you shouldn't though, but I'm just saying again, it's the first thing a doctor is going to tell you to use. And in my opinion, it's not even the most important thing to do off the bat to address hair loss. I think you need to address DHT and androgens before anything. And a growth stimulant can be used down the line. And minoxidil is going to be one of the first things you look to, but just be aware that, you know, going into it, look at your blood pressure and other basic parameters, look at your heart rate. There's a lot of things like this is the other end of the spectrum is not really something to get too tied up in. Again, this was not a fear mongering video is more so just to get a bunch of, have a very, you know, interesting picture and then show this case report of an exceptional thing that I didn't want to just, you know, put in my archive and not have people find because it's just fucking insane to see. But yeah, just getting a sense of exactly what you're getting yourself into because a lot of like, some people don't even understand like the interactions and contraindications of certain drugs interacting with one another and they'll just like use minoxidil because you know, some random YouTube channel told them to, and they didn't even look up to see if there was an interaction with some other drug they're using that's a vasodilator or their other blood pressure medication or whatever, because fucking super big channel over here 
is promoting this, you know, service of finasteride minoxidil without explaining what kind of potential side effects or contraindications the medications may have and just telling you, go get on this right now for hair loss. It's like, yes, you should be proactive. And I always, always harp on that in my channel, but you still need to know what the fuck you're getting yourself into. And that's, I apologize if I was like way too redundant in this video and it seemed like I had no point that I was getting to, but that's, that's the point is, is actually know your health status and what kind of things that could occur before you get into it. So you can be more confident going into your proactive protocol, knowing that you're probably going to be, you know how to mitigate issues should they come up. You know, if you have a higher likelihood of encountering those issues, as well as knowing how your body is going to probably respond in relation to other things. And if you're even a viable candidate for those drugs to begin with, because just because they're over the counter, it doesn't mean that they're side effect free. So that is the end of the story. Again, though, minoxidil is very well tolerated. Most people are going to be fine with it. There's no, nothing wrong with taking it whatsoever. Just be sure you know what the fuck you're getting yourself into. So thank you guys for watching. Please like, subscribe, check out my blog, moreplatesmoredates.com. Follow me on Instagram at moreplates underscore more dates, Facebook, Snapchat, bitch, Twitter, TikTok, Apple Podcasts. If you want to support the channel, you can check out anything I'm associated with in the video description down below my TRT clinic. Um, pharma grade hair loss medications that I use myself. Um, Gorilla Mind, Gorilla Mode, nootropic and pre-workout formulas. I designed from scratch myself and uh, anything else I'm associated with. So check it out. Thank you guys for watching. Talk to you soon.